Simon from Simon Mortimer from CGMS. Um, I thought I should start. Can everyone see the slide? I thought I should start by telling you a bit about my uh, background and career to date. It's also, if I'm if I'm honest, it's the only attempt I get to uh, show any slides of any archaeological interest at all. So starting in the middle, um, I started uh, work in fact, with with Mark Hinman, uh, a site at Stenning in Sussex. Um, I then, uh, after I graduated, I uh, joined the circuit, went digging in, uh, in Sudan and Turkey in particular. Um, coming back from that, I joined uh, the Oxford Archaeological Unit and uh, wrote such luminous publications as Chapter 5, Road Excavations, um, Archaeology of the A419417, Swindon to Gloucester Road Scheme. And what I believe was an early post ex assessment on the Thatcham Northern Distributor Road, which despite Dan Ford's best endeavours, we can't find. Um, crucially, for uh, my development as an archaeologist, um, I spent close to two years working on, uh, for framework archaeology at Terminal 5, then uh, moved through John Samuel's Archaeological Consultants, where I think it's fair to say post excavation assessments never ever caught on. Um, <laughs> became, uh, by default, a consultant overnight when John sacked the field team. And essentially, I've stayed in one place ever since, and everything's moved around me, being acquired by CGMS and then latterly um, RPS. Um, I thought I'd ask all of the existential questions why am I here? Um, <laughs> I think I'm here, and uh, interestingly, having heard Kasia uh, to take a diametrically opposed view to most of what you've said, I'm afraid, Kasia. Um, I think I'm on the panel because <laughs> um, I've got extensive experience of uh, commissioning archaeological projects, predominantly uh, across the East and South Midlands of various sizes. The biggest project I did with um, Albion Archaeology and Mike Luke is also in the room where we strip, strip 67 hectares. Uh, within a meander in the Great Ooze, uh, in just outside Bedford. What I should stress is that the focus of my uh, talk today is almost exclusively on uh, greenfield rural sites. I have very, very limited experience of deeply stratified urban sites. Um, I was also going to say I don't intend or I'll try not to read all my slides verbatim. Uh, so in a nutshell, I think what I'm doing is providing a commercial perspective, and I hope I can address some issues from a sort of practical perspective of how things work on commercial projects. Um, I should say from the outset, I've checked vigorously in preparing my talk um, to make sure that what I'm saying is where I can be universal to profession and to contractors and consultants alike and not just a CGMS thing. So I'm assured that when contracting units are providing costs for projects, they're providing cradle to grave costs for projects from their inception. The costs are provided to clients, including project setup, the fieldwork costs, the post excavation costs leading to publication and archiving. I'm not saying that there are not contingencies or rates or caveats for complex remains, industrial features, waterlogged features, burials, but I am saying that the map to morph picture of project budgets not being fixed from the outset does not sound familiar to me at all. And there's a reason for that, and the reason is that developers want certainty. They want certainty over their costs and program. I think in private, many uh, of our clients would accept that it's only when uh, developments get out of the ground that they think that costs can be fixed. Um, but that doesn't mean that they aren't focused on getting fixed costs from ourselves. And I think it's also fair to say that in truth, there's a completely different mindset between archaeologists and house builders and quantity surveyors. I don't think that many archaeologists are commercially driven, but that doesn't mean that anything that involves rates or the potential to recoup costs later in the project, those things were anathema to QSs. So I think what we're doing with our approach is probably much more naive than a ground worker or a demolition contractor but we get judged by the same brush. Those are the people that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, can everyone read these slides? Can you read them at the back? Um, I asked a lot of my clients uh, for comments or input into today's session, and in fact I only ended up getting four responses. I deliberately approached people who I knew not to be shy with opinions on archaeology, 
Uh, one of my clients, who I must have done 50 or more sites for, said he couldn't comment. So he wasn't familiar with post excavation processes, though he was keen to point out that timescales were ludicrous. Um, I don't think that we realise just how arcane and complex post excavation work is. I'm not entirely sure that lots of archaeologists understand it. Much like the nuanced variations that we get between a watching brief, strip map and record, and area excavation, I think that the, the niceties of post excavation elude us, and certainly elude our clients. What is an updated project design when it's not a post excavation assessment, or a PX statement, or an interim report, or a client report, or a grey literature report, a final report, publication, publication text, or a popular publication? It's not, not surprising that confusion reigns. So, yeah, these are uh, comments from clients which I'll come back to and pick up some of the, uh, some of the issues raised. This amused me, Kasia. Um, you've got to allow me some wistful nostalgia for the good old days of PPG 16 and the old Grampian condition, when conditions were simple and straightforward. And jump to today, and the issue flagged up by, uh, by my client at Miller Homes, we've now got this, a condition that barely fits on one slide, which was apparently designed to be clearer and contains, in its third element, a link to occupancy. We now have a very real situation where people, families having bought their dream home, are going to be forced to camp outside their houses until some environmental specialist returns from foreign climes to prepare the only missing bit of your report, Simon. We've got it all done. It's just the fighter lifts and the pollen, and we can't, we can't give you the report without it. Anyone who doesn't think that this isn't a real issue hasn't spent an awful lot of time with planners. And what we've got on this slide is a fantastic example. I've, I've redacted all the names from it, but essentially we submitted... Um, a report to the planning archaeologist and she quite reasonably came back and she said that the submitted report was okay the text the plans the sections the site photographs are satisfactory but what's missing is a plate showing selection of illustrated farms photographs would be sufficient you will uh, then see that the planners essentially uh, requested enforcement action so there was a stop notice issued against the site and one of the reasons for that stop notice was the fact that the report that we'd sent in didn't have two plates in the back of it. There were, needless to say, other non-archaeological factors involved, but we need to be really, really sensitive and aware of the system that we operate within. And in that context, as discussed, archaeological post-excavation sits very, very oddly with its pollen diagrams and its esoterica. <laughs> Um, before getting on to my slide, I just wanted to make the point that we can't look at the ways that things operate at the moment as if there is any homogeneity or consistency. There are authorities that insist on formal applications to discharge conditions on submission of WSIs, and you can't start for eight weeks until you've got that formal application um, approved. There are other authorities that won't discharge conditions until archives have been deposited, and there are all stops in between. In terms of real impacts, I would say that the lesson from the last recession is that things aren't working, and I'm not sure that anything has changed to make sure that those don't happen again. In 2007, I had calls from many of my uh, shed building clients in particular, firms that didn't need their conditions cleared in a hurry, to say, stop work immediately. Don't do anything else on this project. Some of those projects, as people in the room from the Museum of London will be aware of, had run for 10 or more years, at a time when contracting units were absolutely desperate for work and could have made meaningful incursions into their backlogs, work stops on those projects. We lost a huge amount of knowledge from those sites with the loss of staff. 
And on top of that, when the personnel involved in those same projects and the developer's side also go, it's very, very difficult to ensure payment for projects when the developments have been built out for years. I think we can accept as read that we all want sites published and they should be published as rapidly as possible, as efficiently as possible. In regard to my client Trevor Rockley's comment about the impact of watching briefs, I think that's valid. I think too often we lose sight of the bigger picture. How many sites have we got that we delay getting properly started with the publication because there's one bit of the site underneath the contractor's compound that we can't get to for another 18 months? That's, that's ludicrous. It's, so in terms of framework, I don't think that the framework approach is the only approach that works towards delivering narratives on site, but it is one that I'm very familiar with. It frustrates me that some of the core principles that were adopted by framework aren't more widespread. In tackling large sites, we need to characterise, refine that characterisation, and then determine which are the key elements that make a contribution to research frameworks. That means that on-site sampling becomes targeted and discriminatory, it avoids digging by numbers, and it should mean that in effect we're performing the assessment, assessment phase on-site, but crucially at a point where it can make a difference. If you, as an example, if you find a sample of metalworking residue in samples, you can prioritise that area, you can return to it in a way that you obviously can't in post -ex. This should give the curator confidence that you've established the significance of sites before they're handed back to the developer. I think that all archaeological contractors in the room would probably agree that the flexibility of post-excavation and publication funding, as envisaged by MAP2, is seldom realised. Quantity surveyors and clients expect fixed price budgets, sometimes spanning decades. But there is a hugely positive side to all of this. The number and scale of projects today was simply never envisaged at the time of MAP2. And the profession has grown for the better. We've got better, data, better databases, a greater technical understanding and ability, and we've seen more sites. Our ability to assess the significance of sites is enhanced, as is crucially our ability to cost them and to forecast programmes. One question probably best left for the pub this evening is whether, in fact, we've answered many of the questions that we had, say, for the Iron Age in the East Midlands. Do we actually need to look at the way we publish and what we publish and perhaps accept that some sites don't really move us forward that much significantly? This is the other side of setting out costs from the beginning, that there is a temptation, I think, that we deliver what we've costed for rather than delivering what's proportionate and reasonable in terms of the archaeology that's exposed. So what am I saying? I think what I'm saying is that my clients would really, really appreciate having archaeological conditions discharged within three months of completion of on-site fieldwork. I think many would be prepared to pay for those post ex costs up front or else enter into some form of simple legal agreement committing to pay for those agreed sums. And in that, they've almost always been aware of those costs from the time that the fee quotes were supplied to them. There are, from my experience, some extremely large deals which potentially come unstuck over archaeological conditions. If planners are a literal bunch when they want to be, then lawyers take that one step further. A large warehouse scheme in which I was involved seemed to require some extraordinarily well-paid and aggressive lawyers who just didn't understand why we couldn't get the conditions discharged, and there were millions of pounds riding on it. The frequent blame the specialist cliches, sorry, refrains aren't cliches. We've got an industry that at times seems to depend on a handful increasingly aging and esoteric specialists. You've got to wonder whether the drafters of MPF, MPPF ever envisaged a planning system that was underpinned on occasions by such specialists. We mustn't underestimate the complete lack of understanding of what we do by our clients. They're not idiots. But remember, when you stand on site and you have to explain to them why you're digging where you're digging and you're on a chalk site and you're in the middle of a dark black stained ditch, I don't think that any of my clients, including those I've worked with for the last 20 or more years, understand post-ex, and that's not through lack of trying. 
good field work projects deliver or get close to delivering the assessment phase on site. The sooner we can discharge conditions, the better, more so if in agreeing that we can agree costs and a programme for completion that leaves the control with the archaeological contractor. That way the resources can be allocated and we might avoid the sites that have taken five or more years to publish, particularly through the recession and where key staff have left. It would also mean that developers weren't receiving invoices for sites where the last house was built years ago and all other budgets have been signed off. Thank you.